Good morning. This is Monday, the 4th of September, and I'm Govindra Jethiraj coming to you from Mumbai, India's financial capital. Our top stories and themes for the day. Prime Minister Modi highlights inflation as a global challenge. Countries are growing food to export to India. Uday Kotak steps down somewhat suddenly as the CEO of Kotak Bank. As Jio Finance flexes its muscles, Bajaj Finance announces an expansion. This is a core report with Govindraj Atiraj. Prime Minister Modi said inflation is a key issue the world faces on the eve of the G20 summit that kicks off this week in Delhi. He said that inflation is a key issue that the world faced even as he highlighted India's efforts in the space of renewables, fighting disasters and debt management. Our G20 presidency engaged the G20 finance ministers and central bank governors. It was recognized that timely and clear communication of policy stances by central banks is crucial. This can ensure that policies taken by each country to combat inflation do not lead to negative repercussions in other countries, he said in an interview to PTI, the news agency. He also pointed out significantly that emphasis was also placed on enabling countries to share policy experiences on how they tackle the challenges associated with food and energy price volatility, especially since food and energy markets are closely interconnected. So food prices and food inflation are obviously important and live issues right here in India. And we will touch upon one aspect of food shortages a little later in the show. Mr. Modi also said, as international taxation is concerned, India used the G20 forum to provide a strong impetus to achieve significant progress on what is known as Pillar 1, including the delivery of a text of a multilateral convention. Now, this convention will allow countries and jurisdictions to move forward with historic major reform of the international tax system. Mr. Modi also pointed out the setting up of the International Solar Alliance and took the initiative to bring countries under the vision of one world, one sun, one grid. Elsewhere on energy, he said, India's principle was simple. Diversity is our best bet, whether in society or in terms of our energy mix. There is no one-size-fits-all solutions. And given the different pathways countries are on, India's pathways for energy transition would be different. Coal, oil and gas make up for almost two-thirds of the world's energy consumption and replacing them wouldn't happen overnight. Despite having 17% of the world's population, India's historic share in cumulative emissions has been less than 5%, Mr. Modi said. He also spoke of the Coalition for Disaster Resilience or CDRI so that countries across the world, especially developing countries, learn from each other and build infrastructure that is resilient even during disasters. Now, if you are a regular listener of the core report, you would, of course, know this because we spoke to Amit Roti, the India head of the CDRI or the Coalition for Disaster Resilience, just last week. Mr. Modi also touched upon the debt crisis being a matter of great concern for the world, especially developing countries. First, countries that are going through the debt crisis or have gone through it have begun to give greater importance to financial discipline. Second, others who have seen some countries facing tough times due to the debt crisis are conscious and thus avoiding the same missteps, Mr. Modi said. To accelerate global debt restructuring efforts, the Global Sovereign Debt Roundtable, a joint initiative of the IMF, the World Bank and the G20 presidency, was launched earlier this year. This would strengthen communication amongst key stakeholders and facilitate effective debt treatment, Mr. Modi said. The Kotak Bank Story Two months ago, HDFC, the mortgage giant, merged with HDFC Bank, its offspring that was born much later into its existence, 1994 to be specific, in contrast to HDFC's year of birth, 1977. Just after the merger, an interesting thing happened. Three stalwarts in the now merged company, Deepak Parikh, founder and chairman, Keki Misti, vice chairman and CEO, and Renu Karnad, executive director, all stepped down from their roles in early July. Mistri and Karnad joined the merged board but as non-executive directors, but Parekh was out completely. The HDFC, HDFC Bank and Kotak Bank trajectories are different, but there are some interesting similarities nonetheless, particularly the fact that three senior members of the Kotak Bank management stepped down too. The 64-year-old Uday Kotak wrote out, quite literally, his resignation on Saturday, the 1st of September, on sheets of blank paper without even a letterhead. The move to resign was anticipated, but not so soon, because the checkout date was December 31st. As things stand, Uday Kotak cannot continue as CEO of Kotak Bank beyond December and has had to step away from executive roles on that date. 
He gave two broad reasons for his premature move, including in later interviews. First is sequencing. He said he wanted to ensure that Deepak Gupta, a Kotak Bank stalwart, had the opportunity to stay on in an executive role were the Reserve Bank to accept Kotak Bank's recommendation of Gupta being the CEO. Though we don't know at this point which names Kotak Bank has recommended as successors. Else as things stand, both he, that's Uday Kotak, Deepak Gupta and the non-executive chairman Prakash Apte would leave on December 31st, which is three of them. And that's the similarity to HDFC that I was talking about. Uday Kotak also said he wanted to leave after fulfilling his responsibilities, which included the approval of the financial accounts for 22-23 at the annual general meeting on August 19th. The Reserve Bank takes a final call on who would become the CEO of a bank based on recommendations of names sent by the bank, in this case, Kotak Bank, to them. Now, the options desired by the regulator are both internal and external. Though Bloomberg News last month put out a story saying the Reserve Bank was pressuring Kotak to get outside candidates. Some more background. A few years ago, Uday Kotak took the Reserve Bank of India to court on the issue of not bringing down his stake in the bank to 15% within a stipulated time. The Reserve Bank agreed, sort of, and modified the rules to let promoters keep 26% in the banks they founded, which is where Uday Kotak is presently. The Reserve Bank also issued guidelines in 2021, capping the term of a managing director and CEO of a bank at 15 years, after which he or she would have to take a three-year cooling off. In these three years, the person could not have or will not have any role in the bank, the Reserve Bank had said. Do note that Uday Kotak is now back as non-executive director of Kotak Bank, so the current status would suggest that he may not want to return as CEO even at a later date. But then all this is largely to fulfill the Reserve Bank's wishes, which could of course change or could be influenced. Either way, Uday Kotak, Prakash Apte and Deepak Gupta not being there as New Year dawns on the 1st of January 2024 is a continuity gap for sure. Now, Uday Kotak also said he wanted to sync all of this with family commitments, including an upcoming marriage of his son. In saying this, he did demonstrate a more personal or even soft side, which is somewhat rare for founders and CEOs to do, particularly male. He also said what most parents, whether billionaires or not, would like to say at times like this, even if they hold themselves back, which is that they want to spend time with family at times like this, even as age and time is evidently catching up. Now, whether you believe him or not is up to you, of course. Now come the more operational issues. We spoke of the transition at Kotak Bank a few weeks ago and whether or not Uday Kotak would fully let go. At this point, as we said, he's continuing on the board of Kotak Bank and is of course the single largest shareholder as well. Now, there is no other family member on the board, at least now. Uday Kotak staying on in the board, being something that most shareholders would like to see, is not something the Reserve Bank would like to see. And would not be very comfortable because it implies indirect control, even if in a non-executive capacity. Be that as it may, shareholders would like continuity in more ways than one. Even the system needs it. The price of going from stable founder to maverick CEO, if that happens, would be high, particularly when people's money and savings are involved. Incidentally, Uday Kotak pointed out just the day before that an investment of 10,000 rupees in his company in 1985 would be worth around 300 crore rupees today. I reached out to Hemendra Hazari who is a banking analyst and has been tracking the issue of boards and leadership in banks from a governance point of view. And I began by asking him what he thought of the timing of Uday Kotak's move. Firstly, this is a highly unusual move. Normally, you do not see bank CEOs prematurely resigning before their term ends. And even in the few cases that we have seen this, in those cases, there has been some regulatory pressure and that has made the bank CEO quit before the term ends. But in this case, that does not appear to be the case. And therefore, it is possibly some kind of peace pipe offering that Uday Kotak is giving the RBI that he will depart as CEO while still being on the board as in a non-executive capacity so that ostensibly he will not influence too much the succession issue. Although, as he has said in his interview, that the board has already sent two names to the RBI to consider as a CEO. So it is a very unusual move. I don't think I have seen such a premature resignation before the term ends. I mean, that is without the RBI persuading the individual to step down. So the two reasons that he's given, one of course is personal, but the se- the other one is that uh, the sequencing of departure. So if no one had stepped down, 
On December 31st, the chairman, the non-executive chairman, the joint managing director, the number two effectively, and Uday Kotak himself, all would have gone, which would have definitely created a sudden disconnect. So his argument is that they're trying to sequence the departures. So they know that the number two could potentially at least, I'm assuming it looks like that, though they haven't confirmed it, potentially at least stay on as the managing director. That's Deepak Gupta. See, anyway, we knew that all three have to end that term as of December. And now, by that time, they would have had candidates for both the chairman's post as well as for the CEO's post in mind. So I really don't believe too much in that argument. Because I believe that once they all knew that three individuals would be stepping down as of December and the likely successors for those two critical posts would have already been identified. Right. And, you know, the other point, I think, which again, you also made earlier, uh, Hemendra, is that Uday Kotak, I mean, much as everyone likes him, including his shareholders, continuing on the board as a non-executive director is as good as his being there as CEO or almost as good as his being there as CEO. Most rightly, yes. I mean, it's very poor corporate governance that an outgoing founder CEO does not depart from the board and continues as a non-executive, non-independent director, which effectively makes him the backseat driver in the bank and in the company. And I find it shocking that the RBI has allowed such an engagement to continue. Although, by law, RBI does not have any say in this. Normally, RBI uses its moral persuasion powers to inform boards informally that such arrangements will not be tolerated by the regulator. But in this case, and as I've highlighted in many cases earlier, when it comes to Uday Kotak and Kotak Mahindra Bank, they're always able to get special concessions from the Reserve Bank of India. If you were to take a step back, what is the Reserve Bank trying to achieve in such cases? In such cases, it's very clear that in private sector banking, you must separate ownership from management. That is you know, absolutely critical. And if you have a founder CEO continuing as a non-executive, non-independent director on the board, as it is, as the single largest shareholder, he wields that kind of power. That he has been the only CEO of this enterprise since its inception. So he becomes a super non-independent, non-executive director. And his presence on the board will not only undermine the authority of the new CEO, whoever is selected, but also the chairman of the board. Because of his shareholder holding, because of longevity, he has been early as the CEO. He will undermine all the key positions of the board, which is the CEO and the chairman of the board. The Reserve Bank is uh, doing all of this or heading towards this only because it wants people to retire earlier. I mean, we wouldn't have seen the situation, let's say, if there was no retirement age, particularly in the case of private sector banks, isn't it? No, very clearly, because I'm of the view that in banking, you should not have CEOs of a very long tenure because they tend to have an iconic status. On account of that iconic status, they dominate the board. And they can also dominate and influence the regulator, as I've argued in the case of Uday Kotak and his relationship with the Reserve Bank of India. Right. So in your mind, would you sort of feel that the 15-year time frame for a CEO is optimum or is it more or less? 10 to 15 years, it should be an optimum for a private bank CEO. I don't think it should extend beyond that. Although we have seen in the American banks so very long-term CEOs. but in my view and from the experience that I have seen in India, I am not in favor of long-term CEOs as really they tend to live in an echo chamber because they dominate the organization and the board for so long that they tend to be surrounded by only yes men and women. And then it's very difficult for them to accept you know, any other thinking contrary to theirs. Any other private banks that you're watching now where you see similar succession challenges or transition issues? Yeah, we'll have to see now about the other banks when these transitional issues come. But at least in the private sector, the prominent ones, the CEOs are going to be there for some time. They still have those many years, even by the regulatory norms, to be there. Right, Heminder. Thank you so much for joining me. You're welcome. Thank you.
And in the rest of the markets, just to remind you that the markets were higher over the weekend. The BSE Sensex was up 556 points to settle at 65,387 on Friday. And the Nifty 50 ended at 19,435. That's up 182 points. So well poised for Monday or maybe just about okay. Wheat, rice and now Tur Dal. When you sit down to have dal with your rice next time, there's a 1 by 5 chance it was grown in East Africa before travelling to your table. Between rice, wheat and dal or pulses, India's staple foods are increasingly in the midst of new forces of demand and supply, global and local, and influenced by a range of factors including climate change and geopolitics. Now back to pulses. They are a key staple in Indian food and cooking, of which dal or tur dal is an important one. Pulses are also key sources of proteins in our otherwise protein-deficient country. Researchers at the International Food Policy Research Institute, or IFPRI, have said that the average Indian diet has an excessive consumption of cereals, which is rice and wheat, but is deficient in proteins, fruits and vegetables. Rural India, for example, consumes only 194 grams of protein a day against the recommended 459. Urban Indians consume only 242 grams. Speaking of supply, India's imports of tur dal are rising steadily, having doubled in just the last three years. Some 20% of India's tur dal now comes from imports. More interestingly, African countries like Mozambique, Malawi and Sudan are now specifically growing tur for export to India. And in return, as you know now, India has banned exports of rice to these and other countries. Rice contributes as much as 60% of the total calorie intake for people in parts of Southeast Asia and Africa. Rice prices are now at a 15-year high in Asia. Now back to pulses. India produced about 28 million tons of pulses in 22-23 and some 22% of this 28 million tons are tur and urad dals. So between rice, wheat and now dal, things are seemingly now up in the air when it comes to both availability and prices and more importantly, outlook. So where are we placed right now in the food sweepstakes and how could this rice-wheat pulses equation evolve? I reached out to Siraj Hussain, former Agriculture Secretary to the Government of India, and I began by asking him about how countries outside India were growing food to export to India. There are two major items on which we are dependent on imports. One is edible oils. We consume about 24 to 25 million tons of edible oils every year, but we produce only 9 to 10 million tons, which means that 14 to 15 million tons of edible oil is imported every year. In case of pulses, we have done much better and our import dependence ranges between 12 to 15 percent. Now, what has happened is that after the food crisis of 2006-8, UPA government at that time had launched the National Food Security Mission, which was quite successful. And then the Modi government also took some very good decisions to support the production of pulses, increase the MSP, undertook procurement on a large scale, as a result of which the production of pulses in India has also gone up from about 18 million tons in 2013 to 27 million tons in 21-22. So we have done well as far as the domestic production is concerned. However, this last year was bad and this year is even worse, due to which we have become more dependent on import of pulses. Again, the Modi government did well by signing long-term contracts with Myanmar, Tanzania, uh, Malawi for importing pulses. So we are dependent on other countries for pulses and edible oils. But we are a major exporter of rice and we are an occasional exporter of wheat. So these countries, which you mentioned, Tanzania, Myanmar, and there are a couple of African countries as well, they are producing pulses predominantly to export to countries like India. Is that right? Yes. Yes. So actually our agreement is with Mozambique, Malawi and Myanmar. These three countries, we signed an agreement for Mozambique. 200,000 tons of tour every year for five years and zero duty, no duty. Uh, similarly, from Myanmar, uh, 2.5 lakh tons of Urad and 1 lakh ton of tour again for five years and 50,000 tons from Malawi again for five years, duty free. Now, there is an IFPRI paper documenting the cultivation of tour in Malawi and we find that most of the cultivators in Malawi are smallholders. 
So basically, this long-term agreement is providing a ready-made market to them for export of their produce. I do not know the details, but I understand that the processing of tour in these countries is also done by Indian NRIs, you know, citizens of Indian origin. So there are some reports that they have been kind of holding these stocks and increasing the prices and so on, but we do not know. So the broad point is that we have been importing. However, I must say that in the last three or four years, the import from Myanmar had gone down. Due to that, the Myanmar farmers reduced the production of tur and moved to other commodities for exporting to China. Of course, the dal proportion to rice and wheat is much less, but it's still a staple diet for most homes, particularly middle class homes and so on. So we need dal, we are importing dal. Rice is available in India now, though the prices haven't gone down. Wheat is also steady, but other countries, including those who are exporting to us, are not getting rice, our rice. So how does this situation develop or how could it evolve or develop in coming days and months? My sense is that the government of India will allow export of rice to several countries. It has already allowed to some countries like Singapore, etc. But I think the government of India will consider diplomatic relations and allow the export on diplomatic basis. So in times of shortage, it is not a bad policy to help the friendly countries. And I think we will do that. So as you look ahead, there is a food security problem that's clearly going to get worse with climate change and maybe geopolitical developments as well, like the Ukraine-Russia war, which affected wheat. So how do you see this in future? I mean, you know that we're likely to have shortages in some crops or some food and maybe surplus in the other. And therefore, we have to be more nimble in the way we work both within the country as well as with other countries to ensure that citizens here are fed all the time. Actually, the government had set up an, a committee under the, the then Chief Economic Advisor and several recommendations were made by that committee. I have written an article about that which was published in The Wire a few months back. So, a number of decisions were taken by the government which have been helpful in re- increasing the production of pulses in the country. For example, the MSP of Kharif pulses, that is Tur and Ubad, has been increased by some 46% between 13-14 and 21-22. So, good decision. Moon increased by about 62%. And Chana MSP increased by 68%. So, we have been successful in increasing the production of Chana to such an extent that the import of yellow peas from Canada, Australia, etc. is not required now. And in fact, India has imposed duty on import of yellow peas. So, it is not that we cannot do it. Secondly, there are certain crops, you know, the cultivation of which needs to go down on ecological considerations. For example, rice in certain water-stressed districts of India. So it will not be a bad policy in the long run to reduce the cultivation of rice and sugarcane in certain water-stressed districts and encourage the farmers to cultivate these pulses in these areas. So it is possible, but it is long-term. Unfortunately, we live from election to election, so long-term policies are more difficult to formulate and implement. Mr. Hussain, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks. Geo Financial flexes and Bajaj Finance grows. Bajaj Finance has said it will scale up activity in the business to business segment or essentially retail customers both by volume and value by adding up to a thousand cities in the next three years. This would grow its presence to 5,000 cities, the company told the Business Standard newspaper. Bajaj Finance is expanding its network in Uttar Pradesh, eastern and northern eastern parts of the country. Four years ago, Bajaj Finance was only present in 15 cities in Uttar Pradesh. Today, it's in 450 and eventually plans to be in 700 cities in the state, Anup Saha, the executive director of the company, told Business Standard newspaper. Bajaj Finance's total lending branches have grown to 3,828 in June this year from 2,400 in June 2020. While B2B accounts for 90% of its customers, it constitutes only 10% of its assets under management since the tenor of these loans is shorter. It's also called B2B because it's driven through relationships with dealers and presence at counters in their stores, which you may have noticed if you visited a Chroma, for example. The B2B segment comprises retail lending for consumer electronics, durables and lifestyle product space, the business standard said. 
Now, while several brokerages have acknowledged the risk from Geo Financial, they continue to bet on Bajaj Finance for several reasons. Earlier, Bank of America Security said it was led by Bajaj Finance's focus on diversification and proactive action on unsecured growth. The company reiterated its focus on profitable growth with a target to reach 3 to 4% share in total system credit, according to Bank of America Securities. The key growth levers in focus are customer acquisition, new loan acceleration on capacity buildup, new product launches, and a potential launch of electronic data capture system and payment gateway, the Bank of America said. Foreign brokerage Nomura India also said that concerns about geofinancial services were overdone, according to reports. Nomura India said that setting up a successful unsecured business is relatively difficult for an NBFC or a non-bank finance company, given the low ticket size and inferior customer quality, adding that geofinancial's execution capabilities would only be clear in the medium term. Bajaj Finance, once spun off from Bajaj Auto in a family-linked demerger effort, has assets under management of about 250,000 crores and has a target of achieving assets of management of about 400,000 crores in two years' time. Some interesting international news before I go. Foxconn has been in the news in India as a lead investor in the electronics manufacturing ecosystem, including for Apple products. News now is that Foxconn Technology Group's billionaire founder, Terry Zhao, resigned from his position on the company's board as he ramps up his campaign to become president of Taiwan, according to Bloomberg. Zhao stepped down as director of the company he founded in 74 due to personal reasons, according to a statement from Foxconn on Saturday, that's over the weekend. Foxconn thanked Zhao, who remains its largest shareholder, for his contribution to the group and the global electronics industry. Now, Taiwan in general is seen as looking more closely at India investment opportunities. Foxconn is one visible name, but there are more on the anvil, including, of course, in semiconductors. Watch this space. That's it for me for today. Have a great week ahead and see you soon. Do log in to www.thecore.in and check out our website and stay connected with all the latest business news analysis. Bye for now. This was The Core Report with me, Govindraj Ethiraj. Do stay connected with more of our coverage at The Core. You can check out our website or sign up to our newsletter at www.thecore.in that is www.thecore.in or follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter and Facebook as well. Now, we would love your feedback on how we can make business more interesting and relevant to you including our reporting on India's vibrant manufacturing sector. Write to us at feedback at thecore.in. Thank you for listening.